So to get us started, I would like to invite a dear friend of mine, a mentor and a collaborator, Geshi Karuri Sabina, who is the Civic Tech Innovation Network National Organizer. And I'm sure after today, another friend, a new friend that I'm going to be making, Wolfgang Yaman, who is the Executive Director at the International Civil Society in Berlin, to say a few words about why we are here today. Geshi and Wolfgang, over to you. Thank you so much, Malevo. Um, so my name is Geshi Karuri Sabdina. I am an African woman wearing two blue tops and a pink bandana, and I am joining you from Johannesburg. Uh, and I am so glad to briefly share the stage with Wolfgang here, just to introduce the hosting organizations briefly. We obviously want to have the session move very quickly to the main course, which is this very exciting panel uh, uh, being hosted by the wonderful Malebo Sokodi, uh, who's hosting us today. Uh, and if I can just say a few words, the Civic Tech Innovation Network is a community of practice, and it's made up of innovative Africans with an interest and commitment to leveraging this nexus between technology and civic activism. We launched the network in 2017, and our goal has really been to support this growing community um, towards the growth, the development, the effective use of appropriate technologies, digital technologies, and methodologies in public participation and activism in delivering public services, transparency, accountability, and, and basically connecting government, government to citizens. Uh, we're based in South Africa, but we're very much an Africa-wide network uh, with recently launched regional ambassadors uh, across the continent. Uh, but we also have several international partnerships and collaboration. Uh, and this here is a very good example of it. Uh, we began interacting with uh, ICSC a couple of years ago now. Uh, where it was really just about referring and connecting around voices and uh, perspectives and speakers for various events. It's really our pleasure to be for the first time organizing this series of digital dialogue events with them uh, that will go on uh, throughout the year. Uh, and what we think is we find good value and stakeholder alignment uh, with the ICSC. Uh, we have this strong focus on Africa and technology. And I think what the ICSC brings is a much more global community uh, that's very civically grounded. Uh, and we really look forward to using this platform to invite diverse, grounded, and generative dialogue on ways to share, support, and build upon each other's civic work around the world. So thank you so much for the warm intro, Malebo. Uh, Wolfgang, maybe I can hand over to you. Sure. Thanks, Malebo and uh, Gechi, for kicking us off um, so kindly. Uh, let me also introduce myself properly. So I'm Wolfgang Yaman. I'm a European male wearing a white shirt with um, black glasses and I'm calling you from Berlin where I'm heading the International Civil Society Center which is part of this exciting new partnership together with the CTIN. Um, for us it's a continuation of a successful digital debate series which we started last year and we have redubbed it now Digital Dialogue and it's actually exciting to, to be together with, uh, with you CTIN and um, uh, a few new friends here. It's actually a collaboration between two organizations that have both a global and, in your case, a regional focus. We're based in different parts of the world, but I think we're equally concerned about very, very similar things. Uh, social justice in particular, but also making sure that civil society has um, uh, an enabling and uh, legitimate environment and um, does a good job for a better world. So uh, we're approaching half time of the sustainable development goals. And that's where the international community has promised to leave no one behind. And at the same time, we're wit witnessing, of course, a rapidly accelerating digitalization, which is threaten threatening to create new and quite concerning inequalities. So this part of the digital debate is, of course, trying to inspire us with um, a couple of examples and approaches how can we create inclusive communities? And it's quite exciting to have that opportunity today with the many friends around the table. Thankful for the moderator, Malebo, of course, the um, panelists, the ICSC staff and the CTIN staff for helping us making all this happen. And of course, for everyone to, uh, who has joined the call today. So enjoy the hour. Thank you so much, Geshi, and thank you 
Wolfgang, thank you so much for this collaboration. This is really important work. I, for one, am looking forward to tonight's dialogue, not just as a practitioner, um, but also as someone who is interested in the ways we construct, disseminate, and put into action, you know, particularly um, the knowledge that we that 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 you know we 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 are here gathered for, especially for society around uh, civic tech, and to help us unpack this clarion call of building inclusive civic tech communities, we are joined by two extraordinary panelists. I am fangirling at this point in time. Um, you know, we are joined by them who are pioneers in their respective civic tech fields. So help me welcome um, Onika Magwagwa, who leads the multi-stakeholder engagement across Africa for the Alliance for Affordable Internet, focusing on advancing good practices in policy and regulatory frameworks for affordable and meaningful access to broadband. We are also joined by Asta Kapoor, uh, who is the co-founder of Apti Institute, a research firm examining the interface between tech and society. At Apti, Asta is leading the data and economy lab where she works on data governance, basic income, digitization of welfare, work and social architecture of technology. Now, this is not even as close um, as it comes when it comes to all the things that our panelists have achieved. So if you need more information on our panelists, you can find them on the website. Each panel member will give us a brief presentation to be followed by questions and discussions. So I will remind you that throughout the session, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please pop them in the chat box. And also uh, you can um, go on to any social media, go to social media networks and tweet using the hashtag digital dialogues digit, um, and uh, hashtag inclusivity. So now if we were in person, you know, I definitely know we would get a round of applause at this time. But since this is a virtual gathering, I will imagine this round of applause and um, everyone, you know, wherever you are, even if we can't hear you, even if we can't see you, please, please, with a round of applause, help me welcome Onika and Asta. Onika, you are up first. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for that uh, introduction, Malibu. And thank you so much for inviting me uh, to join you uh, today on this um, dialogue. I am also just fanning the whole idea of being amongst the girls. Uh, my name is Onika Makwakwa. I am a Black African woman uh, with a short Afro hair and yellow handcrafted earrings. I am so really pleased that we are here today to talk about inclusivity, especially in civic tech. I will first start by defining what civic tech means to me. Uh, civic tech to me is really about the access and use of digital technologies uh, for public engagement and for public good. And in order for us to be able to ensure that engagement and that public good, it is really important to, to uh, be inclusive in that uh, uh, purpose. I think it's Wolfgang just a few minutes ago who reminded us that we have a responsibility to leave no one behind. And um, so in, in, in consistent with that, one of the things we have done at the Alliance is uh, a first ever multi-country study on what it means to be meaningfully connected. Um, we recognize that uh, you know, we need to measure how people are meaningfully connected because there remains an even wider inequality amongst those who are already online. We understand that the digital divides are about who is online and who's offline, but also amongst those who are online, there is a huge uh, and emerging uh, digital uh, divide. So we looked at nine countries, eight of which are wonderfully in Africa and only one in Latin America. And what we are, we've learned uh, from the study is that meaningful connectivity is really the boundary between uh, simply consuming information and actively participating in uh, the digital community and digital world. So do we want Africans to just simply be online and consuming all the digital content online, or do we want them to be content innovators and content creators and really engaging uh, and contributing towards um, 
you know, vibrant economies uh, online. And therefore, how they are connected makes a huge difference in them being able to uh, do so. So this latest research actually shows us that those who are meaningfully connected, uh, you know, they're able, they have to uh, use the internet uh, for more essential activities such as accessing uh, healthcare information, taking classes, engaging in dialogues like these ones. So 30 to 33% of those who are meaningfully connected are able to use this access to digital technologies in a way that's empowering and that also enables them to do good in their communities. Uh, there's a huge access gap that exists where only one out of every 10 people across the nine countries are estimated to be meaningfully connected. For example, in Rwanda, uh, one out of five has internet access. However, one out of every 160 can be uh, considered meaningfully connected. So there's a, a, a big disparity and inequality that's uh, happening uh, online. So it's not good enough for us to just tick off the box and say we've gotten people online. It's about how do we build the kind of internet that's empowering, transformative and relevant uh, for us to uh, be proudly and uh, meaningfully connected. Uh, so and also looking at those divides, you know, the existing uh, measure that is used to calculate how a, pe a person has a person who has access to the internet is any internet use in the last three months. And I'm sure we can all agree here that accessing the internet just once every three months does not really make you meaningfully connected or be, you know, give you an opportunity to be able to reap the full benefits of being uh, connected online. But my greatest concern also is the kind of uh, digital inequality that is being created uh, at, in, at the innovation end. We are often told that Africa is a mobile only and mobile first continent. So mobile first might be interesting because it, it basically means that most of people who get access to the internet are first introduced to the internet through mobile uh, devices. However, mobile only is one of those positions that I think we need to challenge and push back on if we want people to be meaningfully connected. Uh, we need to make sure that um, the people, you know, we are not just connecting people to the internet, but we are connecting people in a meaningful way so that these digital uh, technologies are actually uh, useful uh, for them. So, you know, there were. 12% more likely, people who are meaningfully connected are 12% more likely uh, to participate in a way that is more meaningful than those who are just simply uh, connected. And there's a huge cost of this exclusion. We've actually done more research on the cost of gender exclusion in digital technologies that costs uh, governments millions and trillions uh, of, of uh, dollars in, in the economy. And so I will conclude by saying in addition to seeking and pushing for meaningful connectivity, uh, they, it is really important that we begin to mainstream gender in ICT policies. So we are truly not leaving anyone behind, especially women and girls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Onika, for that. Um, and you know, I have worked with Onika and I have mobilized with Onika before, and I am so grateful for the work that you do. And I'm, I'm glad that you started off with um, talking about what civic tech is. And just quickly before we call on our next panelist, uh, it was interesting for me before we came here, I on my social media networks, I asked the question, what do you think civic tech means? And it was interesting that some people were like, I don't know. And then I'd be like, but you are in civic tech. So sometimes the language also uh, brings a great divide. But thank you so much for that, Onika. And our next panelist, go ahead, Asta. Uh, we're looking forward to um, getting some insights from you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here and uh, also for um, bringing me into this extremely important conversation. I'm Asta Kapoor. I am a brown woman um, in, based in India, Bangalore, and I'm wearing a red, also handmade dress. Um, I'll actually take off from where uh, Onika left off. And I think that the work that is happening on civic tech is from the lens of access. I actually look at technology from the lens of 
negotiation uh, a little bit because for us living in India, and I agree with Anika 100%, there's a huge amount of variation in people who say have access to technology, are they able to meaningfully use it? Uh, what is the distinction between um, the genders? What is the distinction between people living in rural areas versus urban areas? You know, in India, there's another complexity of caste. So, you know, are people of certain caste able to access technology much better? We've done some interesting work on um, also understanding that uh, tech needs to be or access to technology needs to be mediated by offline intermediaries uh, at the last mile or the first mile, however you phrase it, because uh, technology needs to be unbundled, it needs to be explained and, in, and people need to be handheld through that process. Um, but like I said, my lens uh, and in the work that we do at the Data Economy Lab uh, at Apti Institute is uh, on the question of negotiation. And in some ways, it's about once you do have access to civic tech and, you know, again, like coming back to India, I think it's uh, about 50% of the people have access to a smartphone. And by uh, 2040, it's supposed to be 96%. And, you know, one assumes that a meaningful percent of that will be able to engage with technology in some kind of reasonable way. However, uh, what happens once you engage with technology and what happens as we're, you know, generating all of this data, how do we a meaningfully use the data meaningfully resist um, the, the sort of extraction of data that we're all sort of going through? How do we meaningfully engage with both the state and the private sector using technology? And again, like how do we negotiate on questions of our rights? So I'll give you an example, right? Like, I mean, we've all obviously seen the, the idea of, uh, or, or, or the issue of say, um, the Cambridge Analytica question. We've also been looking at things like, uh, you know, Uber and all the other app ride hailing apps, etc. There's an extreme amount of data extraction. And that's not just the case with the private sector, even the government, which is, you know, the is becoming increasingly digitized, is trying to extract more and more data. And it's under the garb of uh, you know, providing better services, making things happen for its citizens, and providing sort of digitizing that civic function. But at the core of that is a certain data extraction. And I think that as we talk about inclusion and access, we should also talk about how do we negotiate with technology? How do we make sure that, uh, you know, the relationship between the citizen and the state is not that of, uh, you know, you give me data and I give you services. I am entitled to those services. I am, and civic technologies, whether it's, you know, interfaces like in the context of India, uh, you know, we have digital ID systems that uh, are, are part of like uptake of rations and food support. Those have become extremely um oppressive in a certain way, they've become exclusionary, and they've also empowered the state in a way that had not happened before. So we also, while we talk about access of civic technologies, we should think about what are the governance mechanisms for these civic technologies? How do we think about not just the individual experience of do I have a smartphone, but also what does this mean for my community? What does this mean for me as a minority living in a country? Uh, what does this mean for me as a collective of women? And how can we come together on questions of technology? Because what is interesting and happens all the time is that technology is considered to be a very private experience, my experience with my smartphone accessing my entitlements with the government. However, it's not that. It's actually a collective experience. And, you know, as we move to a more digital state, uh, we are atomizing ourselves much more. And that community um, accountability that the offline mechanisms of being able to stand in line for your entitlements or etc which were nowhere perfect but there was a physical manifestation of hunger anger discontent protest all of that has just vanished because of the digital and i think those are the elements that we need to bring back and that's why like i said my lens to civic technology is negotiation because what is happening is that our ability to negotiate with the state is is diminishing um, and because we're not hitting the streets enough, because it's all your your oppression, your exclusion, uh, your surveillance is all digital and it's therefore invisibilized in a certain way. And, um, and that's why um, I think that we need to expand the scope of how we negotiate with technology and data and both with the state as well as uh, with the private sector. So I'll pause there.
Thank you so much, um, Asta, for those notes. Um, it's, I mean, there is such an intersection between you and Anika, and I don't know, Anika, if you want to join us um, at this point. And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and I think I want to start off um, bef at, the, at the place of access, right? Especially like during the pandemic, we have seen this digital exclusion, the gap get wider and wider. And we have seen how things have played around, out, even in, in societies where you'd, you'd imagine that there would be some access. So in your respective works, what kind of challenges have you seen and concrete cases that you have interacted with or that you have come across during the pandemic that you think, you know, these challenges are urgent and we really, really need to focus on. I'll start with you, Annika. Yeah, certainly. So I think for me, uh, you know, in terms of what we saw during uh, COVID, uh, one is an affirmation that access is no longer a luxury, right? It's just, we cannot just leave it to the privileged few uh, to have access, but it's actually a lifeline. Uh, but also it, um, it not only exposed our deep inequalities, but just also how uncoordinated our digital development strategies are. One example is South Africa, where uh, you know we were basically all of us kind of following the West in terms of how they are monitoring, tracking, and responding to COVID nineteen. So the West put out apps for their citizens to monitor. They did e registration for vaccination, and we did exactly the same. However, what was very ironical was that we had to start our vaccinations with the population of sixty and older. But that is a population that spends up to four hours monthly waiting in a queue for their subsistence allowance from government. A program that could have been digitized a long time ago, but for very uh, specific reasons has not moved in that direction. But somehow we expected this population uh, of 60 and older to be able to e-register, EQ, um, completely different from how they live their, how we expect them to live their everyday lives, right? Hence, we started seeing the delays in the uptake of vaccinations in the beginning, because here we are now kind of like, you know, uh, taking a, a very uh, different approach in terms of how things are done than how we've done all the time. So that for me should really be a lesson. You know, the other one is with schooling. I think there was this assumption that children can learn from home remotely. In fact, I just finished doing a paper uh, on this uh, for one of my human rights courses uh, to look at, you know, should we be looking at internet access as a human right and begin uh, to move in that direction. When you look at the children, uh, the assumption was that parents are digitally literate, uh, that homes are connected, and that teachers are also digitally literate to be able to conduct instruction over the internet. So there were a lot of assumptions uh, that were made that just really did not match with the reality of what we're actually dealing with. But I think that those are all opportunities for us to now begin to build uh, on that uh, as opposed to, uh, it's a bit frustrating because sometimes I feel like we even talk about 4IR as if it's an event that's coming, <laughs> you know? But how do we really take these concepts into, uh, to begin to innovate for Africa's realities and stop this Uberization of everything? Like, you know, our innovation sort of has this Western gaze for the most part. We want to be the next Uber of Africa, the next Amazon of Africa. The next Amazon of Africa might actually look more like Maravastat or Makola, Mall, uh, Makola Market in Accra. So how do we get our innovators to begin to innovate and put Africa's challenges and opportunities at the center of the innovation so that we are not necessarily innovating based on what the West has already done and we want to also have our African version of that. Um, thank you so much. And Asta, do you have anything to add then, particularly on how then do we foster you know, inclusive platforms or ways that we can get um, civil society involved in dealing with these kind of challenges that we have, um, you know, come across. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll give you an example of also what we went through uh, in India during the, you know, as the vaccines became available is that uh, a lot of governments, I think, decide that like there should be an app for it, uh, because how else would you access vaccines if not through an app? Uh, so, of course, there was an app for it. It was, you know, you needed a lot of government ID to be able to log in. You needed a phone. Um, so there were all of these hoops of um, of bureaucracy things that people needed to do of course along with that layered you know digital literacy access to smartphones so all of the big questions of access that Onik already spoke about um and and I think that to what ended up happening is that civil society organizations became like I said those mediators that would help people log in uh get access um you know support people offline so like I said you need these offline intermediaries uh that can help uh, translate technology that can bridge the gap because you know like I said the state assumes that if you digitize something it still exists but what that does is that it increases the distance between the citizen and the state and that distance needs to be bridged it doesn't automatically happen just because there's an app for it there needs to be mm -hmm. a lot of labor that's done on the ground to uh, onboard people to make them aware and not just make them aware like I said earlier like not just make them aware to be like here's a government app but like for instance in India we realized that you were logging on to it was called COVID uh, uh, app to access vaccines but some people were surreptitiously been also given health IDs that we have not consented for. So you don't even know what you're consenting for. Uh, and the government, like I said, is a player in data extraction. So it's not just about, um, about you know, ensuring that, yes, you get access to an entitlement like a vaccine uh, in the middle of a global pandemic, but also that the government should not use this moment to exploit you in ways that you can't even comprehend. And I think that's where civil society comes into play. It's not just to bridge access, but it's also to create frictions in this process of digitization. It's to create um, that noise, that echo of things that needs to happen to make sure that we um, as a community are not getting exploited. And so, I mean, and, I, and I'll plug this in, but we're working on the idea of these intermediaries, both offline and online, um, that 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 will help us think through our rights, uh, both in terms of our entitlements, as well as our negotiations, and actualize that because some of this needs to be delegated out. And I think that that's where civil society will come into play, because we're not a equipped to speak the language of technology. We're not equipped to read those consent notifications. Um, and I work on this and I never read them. So um, I think that we need to have civil society play a much, much bigger role uh, in that. Uh, yeah, and I think um, if, you, if you both could please keep your videos on because we are having a conversation and then we will also include the audience um, just just now so that we can get their questions. And yeah, I mean, talking about this gap is always interesting, right? This gap between policymaking, civil society and technology. The wider that gap goes, the more distrust, you know, exists within um, civil society. So it's really important for us to find ways, you know, to, to meet at this gap. But while I still have you, um, Asta, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about governance, you know, um, Onika spoke about 4IR and it's a, you know, it, there was a point where it was a frenzy in South Africa, the fourth industrial revolution. We need to be ready for this tech um, revolution. But if you look globally, you see that we are watching um, like an emergence of big tech, you know, like AI, et cetera. So where do you think the governance is going to be in civic tech in mitigating, you know, the trust that civil society has, but also this efficiency that our countries are chasing in terms of this emergence of big tech. Yeah, so big tech is very exciting, right? Like, I mean, in the sense that uh, as, as anybody who has had a micro thought and said like, oh, today I'm going to, I don't know, like do embroidery, which was something I thought that I would do during the pandemic and like immediately went to Amazon and like gave me an embroidery kit that I never used. So it's extremely attractive. Um, and also I think for civil society, right? Like, I mean, leaning on things like Facebook and Twitter to talk about your work to, you know, also um, enabling things like, you know, using campaign mechanisms, all of that, even for civil society, it's extremely attractive. But 
walking that line, like I said, is, is extremely important. And the way that we can think about governance is, of course, one is that we need to think about those rights. So like Anika said, rights to access of internet. We in India have some of, we're delinquents on internet shutdowns. Uh, you know, you have exams and you don't want students to uh, cheat, you shut down the internet now. It's it's absurd when you think about it, but uh, this is the response of the state. So you need the lines in the sand to say like, you can't shut this down. This is, this is something that needs to happen in the Supreme Court. This is not something that a low level government officer can willy nilly decide because children might might cheat. Um, so, you know, so there are some rights that we need to absolutely make sure that we have, for instance, right to privacy, where does my data go? So I think a lot of us, um, and if I may say in the global south are struggling with those rights, India has been talking about a data protection framework, we don't have one. So I'm just sitting here. And I don't know how the data in my life that I'm generating on technology platforms will be used. I also don't know things like when I will be censored, when I will not be censored, you know, like all of those things are up and uh, up in question, and I think they need to be defined much, much more. And I think, again, like, there's a huge role for civil society organizations, which I also consider myself to be a part of, to advocate for what those rights might look like, um, where they might be applicable, what are the exceptions, because of course, there are exceptions, and the government is very good at being like, national security, at least in the context of India, is a huge exception, so it keeps the government out of any kind of accountability, right? Um, so what are the exceptions? What is reasonable? And again, like, how do we... Um, how do we get accountability? How do we hold the government accountable for being uh, lax on its responsibility to provide services, lax on its a responsibility to provide safeguards? Uh, we don't know what those accountability mechanisms are, especially when big tech is involved, because you think like, oh, it's actually Facebook that's the delinquent. It's not the government of India, but actually it's the government of India that has not enabled Facebook to be accountable. Mark Zuckerberg is there every like few months in those Congress hearings. Why is he not here answering to us, the biggest user base in India? Because our government is not able to hold him accountable. And that's the difference uh, in the way that, that we use big tech and India is like a playground for Chinese big tech and Indian big tech and we have our own issues and and the biggest gap is that the government is not able to hold technology companies accountable because they're a player in all of this and so if you regulate the government you will regulate you know the other players and you can't do that yeah thank you and you know in the interest of time so um we're going to just go ahead and involve the audience so if you have any question please feel free to put it into, into our chat box. I am chatting to Anika Makwakwa and Asta Kapoor, and we're talking about building inclusive civic tech communities. And we could have this conversation the whole day, you know, um, and thank, thank the digital angels that we can meet, you know, um, from different continents like this and have this really interesting conversation. Anika, we'll start with you. There is a question in the chat box. It says, hi, Anika. Given the latest report around inequality in South Africa, does this inequality reflect on the study you conducted? And what are some of the solution, um, you know, private and government um, that they are implementing, if any? That's a really great question. So one of the things that I always insist on when we do a study uh, on South Africa is to throw away the averages because you are dealing with a society that has such extreme inequalities that anything that is based on average GNI is always going to be skewed. We are going to always come out as affordable, as you know, successful, unrecognizable to most of us who actually live here. So for example, we do uh, one of our signature uh, research is the affordability index for internet access, uh, which basically uh, the affordability uh, index uh, basically states that uh, you must not spend more than 2% of average monthly GNI for one, at least one gig of data per month. Uh, so there's a couple of things that I challenge with that one, one gig of data per month uh, would have been finished uh, maybe 15 minutes into this conversation. Uh, so it already is a very low threshold. But when you actually do the affordability index on South Africa, South Africa actually comes off as, you know, being affordable because on average we come below the 2%. But what we do also is to look at the data and splice the population into 
income quantiles. And then we can find that, you know, the lower 40, the, the lower two, uh, two uh, income quantiles in South Africa actually are not affordable. And some may be paying as high as 20% of average monthly uh, income. So affordability of data is, is just not uh, something that's affordable to everyone, especially those who need it the most. And those are the ones that the lower income quantile. In terms of what is being done by that, I, you know, I understand then there's an announcement recently of a 50 gig um, subsidy per person, per month. We will see how that works. One of the great things that a lot of African governments do is that we are really good at adopting these positions, right, to these documents. Uh, but implementation has been really uh, difficult, right? So, um, you know, th there's absolutely no reason why we should not be using some of our universal service and access funds, uh, which are the ones controlled by ICASA in this country, to make sure that there's public uh, access at minimum. So public access would be things like public Wi-Fi in uh, public places like libraries, municipalities, communities, bus stops, malls, uh, schools, um, and keep it open for the community after hours because it's already paid for. <laughs> so for me, it's really things like those that we have to really begin to think outside of the box in terms of how we are using our universal service and access funds, which by the way, every country uh, in, in mostly in this continent has uh, this fund. And we can really begin to use it beyond just paying for infrastructure. These funds can also be used for developing digital skills. They can be used for subsidizing devices, which, you know, with the COVID situation, we realize how expensive devices are. In fact, in this region, uh, devices are cost an average of 40% of monthly average income. So for most family households, it's a decision between buying a, a, a mobile device for one person or buying a microwave, for example, that is something that would enable the entire uh, households to utilize. So the cost of um, devices is actually also uh, challenging and therefore so using our universal service and access funds that are there to defray some of this cost in order to create this inclusivity. Uh, for South Africa in particular, it's very important because we are among the most unequal societies uh, in the world and that income gap uh, just really makes it unaffordable and exclusive. Thank you. Um, thank you, Annika. You know, it's so beautiful for me in, in particular to see a panel or just a screen of black and brown women, because one of the biggest conversation is fostering, um, you know, inclusion, those voices that are underrepresented. And it's usually women, even where I teach and do research, um, I used to be at VETS and now I'm at UCT. This is an, an ongoing struggle on how do we foster spaces? Um, that include uh, women. So Asta, I want, I'm going to read a question from the chat box um, that you can think on. And if Annika, you want to also chop in, you can do that. Um, is there a real life impact on governance or democracy when women collectively mobilize as second class citizens calling for equal rights and democratization in authoritarian authoritarian regimes like Sudan, where this community has been historically marginalized based on gender. So Asta, you can go ahead and then Annika, if you have anything to add. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I actually believe that the only way to negotiate on technology is collectively and whether it's women or whether it's and I think that everybody is marginalized when it comes to technology, right? Uh, levels of marginalization may differ, but we're all marginalized just because we don't understand it. Like, I don't know how an email is transferred from point A to point B. I don't know how we're enabled uh, this Zoom call and I don't know the cost of doing the Zoom call at this point. Um, so, um, you know, I think we're all marginalized and I think that, you know, collective bargaining is the only way to do it um and i think that while i don't know examples of where women are collectively bargaining on questions of technology i do know of other vulnerable groups so for instance uh app drivers uh are are a good example who are you know in their their livelihood is enabled through technology but increasingly are also realizing that there's something called algorithmic surveillance that if you are playing uh, a game on your phone then uber knows about 
about it and will not send you a ride. Is Uber entitled to do that just because you're taking some time for leisure and whatever? No, they're not. But so app drivers are increasingly becoming aware that their data is being used to uh, surveil them and to, to uh, disenfranchise them and, and take away their livelihoods, et cetera. So they are coming together in various forms uh, to set up things like data cooperatives, for instance, that are driver owned and driver run and, uh, and are able to say to Uber, like, this is how you're manhandling our data and this is how you should not be doing that. And I think there are lots of examples of this collective bargaining where people uh, are coming together. I'll give you another example, which is more about questions of access and equity, which is that in India, we have something called these accredited health workers that are being forced to use uh, apps and they are, you know, considered as volunteers and there's lots of inequities and these women are on the streets trying to negotiate with the government on better, um, better pay, which is a very traditional form of protest, but it's because technology has meant that the pay that they used to get is, 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 is less than it used to be. So there are examples of people coming together at various forms, but I think that we need to think of what those mechanisms are because they can't be traditional in a certain sense. We have to think of new governance mechanisms that enable collectivization online because if I'm in a Facebook group, but I'm also doing other things, like is that my community? Is my community a Facebook group? And will that help me negotiate or will it be another thing? And I think that that's what we have to think of more is that what is our community when it comes to uh, technology? And that's not entirely clear. Annika? Yeah, certainly. So, you know, one of the things I really uh, love about what you're saying, Esther, is this connection between our offline lives and our digitized ex existence, right? That there needs to uh, be a preservation of our rights that we enjoy in society when we are also online and that goes with privacy and all of that. I'll just give you just one quick example. Uh, it is quite common uh, in most hotels when you check in that they take your passport and they photocopy it and then you leave, right? So one of the things I learned to do a long time ago was when I check out to ask them for a copy of my passport because yes, it's, the, it's on paper, it's not the actual passport, but it's a copy of my passport because I don't know after I leave what happens to the passport? Who keeps it? Who has access to this file? Um, but it's that kind of, of a civic engagement uh, that we participate in in protecting our lives in real life that we now need to understand we must do online as well. South Africa recently had an incident with uh, bolt drivers, for example, that was happening uh, on a digital platform, but it required mobilization offline. And I think that that's really important for us to not forget that online is not some space that exists independent of our, off, of, of, of our offline existence. And so one of the best campaigns that I have seen come out of this region, which unfortunately uh, probably needs to come back again. It's a campaign called Fast Africa, which is about access to a fast, affordable, safe and transparent internet. That safe and transparency is really important now. A lot of the, even the data privacy laws that we are adopting, uh, we're adopting either because Poppy Act is catching up with us. Uh, so they are really coming from elsewhere and we are just kind of finding ourselves needing to uh, embrace them, but also we have not developed the kind of legislation uh, and law enforcement to make sure that uh, we are safe, right? And, and we're not even talking about online violence against women, which is a whole other uh, area of uh, civic tech and policy development that uh, really urgently needs attention. Thank you. Thank you. And in the words of Wolfgang, and I think you, Annika, also echoed of um, no one is left behind, but also in you know the whole idea of do no harm. I think when we do think about tech and we think of it of, of its value um, in terms of what what does it drive, especially in in societies like ours. So I'm going to read another question. It and and it, it can be posed to any of you. It says my question is how do we make the technology developers mostly in the private sector, especially when they're thinking about efficiency, responsible given the growing use of technology by the authoritarian regimes against civic space. Um, Asta? 
Yeah, I think that I think that tech companies need to rethink how they do tech. Uh, in some ways, like, uh, and I think that's coming apart, right? Like the the tech bros building technology and thinking like, oh, build and they will come and all of that. And you can see that uh, breaking down. And uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's declining wealth is a good sign of that. However, uh, I think that what we do need to do is. Uh, to the point that was made earlier is also find ways um, to do tech in a multi-stakeholder way. And I know that multi-stakeholderism is something that has many interpretations and many failings. But I think that uh, for, for those building tech need to seek out uh, those that use tech. And civil society, of course, is a really, really, like I said, a good bridge for organizations to do that. And I know that people run tests and user research and all of that, but I think that's very much from the lens of like, is this product good? I don't think it's from the lens of, is this product doing harm? And I think that shift is critical. And, you know, um, there are lots of movements of tech workers saying like tech won't build it movement. I don't know if people have come across that, but like people have said like, we won't build technologies um, for ICE surveillance, I think in the United States, there's increasingly a lot of movement within tech workers uh, to Microsoft obviously had has had walkouts, uh, Facebook has had them. So there are some small examples of how that's happening, but I think greater sensitization and shifting the lens of, of a product from convenience, which of course is important, but to questions of harm. And I don't think we think of technology from the lens of harm enough. Um, thank you, Ryan, Utam, and Rifile for your questions. I'm sorry that I didn't call out your names when I was reading the question. Um, so Anika, there is a comment and question by, and I'm sorry if I pronounce the name incorrectly, Eguatu Onye Jelem um, in the, in the, in the, in the um, chat box, in the comment box. I don't know if you want to speak on it. It is a little bit lengthy, um, but it is available for, for you to read then and speak on it. But while Anika reads that, um, on your last point, Asta, there is a question that say, is there space for the metaverse in civic tech or within civil society? <laughs> I don't know. I don't comment on metaverse. I don't comment on Web3. Uh, I just, uh, I, I'm not there yet. I think that these are <laughs> conversations that are 10 years <laughs> away. Uh, and I think that, uh, I think they distract us from the inequities and issues of today because uh, we uh, we start to focus on the next glimmering thing. Um, yeah. But I think that there will be a significant amount of harm, at least from the way that I look at it right now. I'm in my limited understanding uh, of coming from metaverse. And I think that that will need a new set of laws and regulations. But uh, I must confess that I'm not equipped to speak about that today. I will be hopefully in the next couple of years. <laughs> Yeah, it's also interesting in, um, you know, with our students in the different institutions that I've worked at, at the moment, like a lot of the students want to research or do their dissertations in the metaverse. And it's just so interesting. Uh, but another conversation for another day. Anika, do you want to address the comment that's, that's in the box? Yes, certainly. So it was to, and thank you so much for that uh, very detailed and, you know, giving us a, a really good picture uh, of that. And, and I totally agree with uh, your comments uh, with regards to also the need to also develop legislation, right? So policies, great, you know, implementation seems to be a struggle, but legislation uh, as well. And more specifically around the issue of devices, I think um, one of the bigger challenges uh, for us with devices is that uh, I don't know who's been around when we were promised that Africa was going to get a $10 phone. Like I'm still waiting for it. Uh, but part of the challenge is that we come up with these slogan type goals, right? That we're going to get a $10 phone for Africa, but we don't actually really map out what that looks like. Uh, does that look like um, a company that, you know, is actually based in Africa? Does that look like negotiating mm. with the current uh, developers of devices so that we have some level of, of, of assembly that's done locally? So, for example, I've always said that uh, there is no reason for all of these phones to arrive here fully packaged with even the software already installed. There's an opportunity to create a market locally for 
local assembly of some of those parts, including content, um, you know, uh, like software uh, installation in those. Because what that does is that it helps us build, retool uh, our workforce uh, in, in the region, but it also could help drive uh, the cost down. But the conversation that happens between government and private sector right now around devices is predominantly around reducing device uh, import duty which I do support. However, there needs to also be something that private sector offers the region as well in order for that uh, to happen. So there needs to be this win-win. And I think I, I really like uh, the challenge around engaging civil society, because I think a, there's a trust deficit that exists between civil society and government, between civil society and private sector, and between government and private sector as well, especially uh, in technology uh, development. And that uh, the multi-stakeholder approach would actually really um, help us to bring some of these issues to the table so that we don't end up with in initiatives that um, you know, are started without consultation and end up not being successful, then they're abundant. When, uh, and, and, and I'll just give you a more concrete example, digital uh, centers uh, in, in, in a lot of countries they, where they've decided to build digital centers in the rural areas. And then they find out people are not going. Well, some of the reasons people don't go is because you built it in an area where it's unsafe for women to travel, where there's no consistent electricity. But if you had engaged civil society in that region, you would have been able to get uh, their input into that. So, you know, I think uh, uh, NGOs have this slogan, nothing for us without us. So making sure that we are engaging the communities that we are building for uh, in all of that. But absolutely legislation, I think, is a really where we need to be moving towards, especially around this issue of taxation, because while we talk about big tech, there's also a lot of taxes that are now being imposed on consumers, uh, that, uh, VAT on airtime, SIM card registration tax, communication service tax. Meanwhile, governments, most governments have not figured out a way to actually tax big tech companies that are operating in the region and therefore missing a huge opportunity for revenue while uh, overtaxing uh, digital consumers were already quite stretched. Thank you so much. And in the interest of time, I do wish that we can go on, but the conversation doesn't end here. Um, you know the hashtags to use, uh, hashtag digital dialogues, hashtag inclusivity. Let's continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Asta and Onika. And just one minute each, one minute each. Close, not two, one minute each. Um, <laughs> even half if you can do it. Just your closing comments um, before, we, before we, we say goodbye to everyone. Asta. Yeah, I think uh, to make technology access more meaningful, I think that we need to do the old school, organize, mobilize, agitate, uh, and, and see where that takes us. Thank you. Anika? Uh, we have a moral obligation to leave no one behind. And so it's really important for us to be intentional around how we are closing the digital gaps, especially the digital gender uh, divide that is leaving women and girls uh, behind in this digital uh, innovation, as well as uh, possibility for participation, participating in digital economies that should be inclusive. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. What a great way to end off. And I am really excited. This has been a great first installment of the Digital Dialogues uh, series. And thank you so much to the collaboration between Civic Tech Innovation Network and the International Civil Society Center for just coming together and uh, putting this together. It has been really riveting. And I know that one of the things that I'm taking away from this is that the community constantly needs to be at the center. And in whatever decisions that we make, we do no harm. And one of the things that I have realized as well is that civic tech goes way back. And many times because of the language, because of the exclusion, and because when we think of technology, you know, we think of this uh, thing that there are many, many uh, civil societies that are mobilizing, that are involved in civic tech. And we need to talk about the ideas of access and how do we foster, you know, how do we become part of governance? How do we foster uh, policies? How do we foster legislation that puts the community 
in the center. And um, I'm really excited to announce that we will be having our next conversation on, uh, in, on happening on the 7th of April, and it will be hosted by Bob Iverson. And um, the topic uh, for that session will be how can international CSOs help or hinder grassroots tech innovation? Really, really interesting conversation that will actually help us how then do we form networks, you know, South to South, you know, those are the languages that are used, but networks that help us, you know, support uh, one another in this feat. Thank you so much, Asta. Thank you so much, Anika, um, for joining me. And thank you everyone who has been working in the background to make this a really, really successful dialogue. It's been my pleasure. And from Chile, Johannesburg, bye-bye.